Okay, we have our first project here for Dent 2004, January 2020. Uh, it's a Kennedy Class 3 Modification 1 Maxillary model. I'm going to spend the next uh, several moments here and block it out, some things that you should be thinking about. Um, we can see here, the first thing we should do is look at the script. And we have a uh, palatal strap uh, clasping uh, one six and two seven within acres. One three and two three are aproned with rot wire clasps. Now we didn't state if these rot wire clasps are going to be stainless steel or tyconium, but I think for this project we'll probably do the uh, tyconium wires and laser weld them into the uh, edentulous carriages here. Um, I think one advantage is of uh, laser welding them is that it would maintain the modulus of elasticity of the wire. Uh, once we put this tyconium wire in the uh, burnout oven up to 1875, uh, they become heat treated and uh, almost dead soft. So they'll maintain some elasticity if we bend them and laser weld them post uh, construction of the uh, casting. But the first thing we should do is start at the set zero position here for our path of insertion. I'm going to identify the guide planes of distal of 1, 3, mesial of 1, 6, distal of 2, 3, mesial of 2, 7, and try to equalize these guide plane undercuts, if any exist. Here on the 2, 7, there's a slight uh, undercut. Uh, again, I'm starting at set zero, or pretty much close to thereof. I'm looking at the distal buckle undercut of the acres of 1, 6, and try to equalize the depth of the clasp on 2, 7, as well as on 1, 3, and 2, 3, which will be rot wire clasps, but they'll be engaging at 0.75 millimeters undercut rather than the cast clasp acres retentive arm at 0.25 millimeters undercut. So these uh, uh, clasps on the anterior obviously are in the aesthetic zone. I'd like to lower them a little bit. And um, I'm going to tilt the model slightly backwards to see if I can get these clasps lower, which I can, without introducing any undercuts on the guide plane, very slightly on the 1-3, and obviously zeros on the posterior molars. This is zero, lower. I think I've gone a little bit too far to the left-hand side. And at the same time, maintaining the same height of contour on the posterior molars. I'm come back slightly here. Now, there's no right or wrong. I think there's just a, a closer to more advantageous than less. When we're doing the path of insertions, everyone's will be slightly different. Um, there's no uh, millimeter readings on our surveyor table. And once I'm satisfied with my path of insertion, I can tripod the model in several ways. Uh, I can use the analyzing rod on the posterior base of the model, outlining the analyzing rod carefully with a sharp graphite pencil on an x-axis, as you can see here, on a y-axis of the model. I think for... Um, Provincial examinations, they probably want you to put uh, three widely spaced points on the palatal surface of the model. So I'm going to uh, put the graphite pencil into the surveyor. I'm going to take out the analyzing rod and I'll start with tripoding at three widely spaced points. I need to lock the um, vertical member of the surveyor in one plane. I'm going to just make this graphite a little bit tighter if I can sneak it up a bit. And then maybe we'll try here. So one, two, and three. I'm going to take my graphite pencil and cross those lines and circle them. This is about a three millimeter circle. Not too small, not too large, as to kind of take away from the drawing that we're going to do on the model. So we have a tripod. We have a path of insertion dictated. And now I'm just going to scribe the height of contours 
of all the abutment teeth, starting with that of one six, one three, two three, and these are the labial buccal surfaces. Height of contours are a little bit high on the molars. And then conversely, on the lingual side, if there are any uh, height of contours. So it looks like we might have some here on the anterior canine, so our aprons must cover this undercut. Um, once I'm finished marking the height of contours, I'm going to put in the 0.25 millimeter undercut gauge into the surveyor. I'm going to measure the depth of undercut here at the distal buckle of 1.7. I'll take my red pencil. I'll try not to scratch the tooth. I'll double check that this is the point of engagement here. And then I'm going to freehand one third below the height of contour, two thirds above would be my retentive arm in the red line here as scribed. Do the other side. If we had a diagnostic model and the dentist was going to do further preparations, possibly we could say to contour these molars and canines to lower the heights of contour to keep these clasps possibly a little bit lower. Definitely in the anterior out of the aesthetic zone. So I'm gonna put 0.75 millimeter undercut gauge in my surveyor for the anterior, a little bit deeper because these clasps are a little bit more flexible, a little bit more resilient, they can go lower and engage more height of contour. They're a little bit more pleasing to the abutment tooth. And as well as we can stay below the height of contour with our uh, stainless steel or Tyconium rot wire clasp, maybe two thirds to four fifths below the height of contour. And I'm going to freehand draw that as well. Once I have the depth gauge, Now I'm using the Nays Surveyor, which all of you have, but we could also use something a little quicker in the laboratories, like a, uh, a heated tip paratherm or other various types of longer armed um, surveyors. A lot of those commercial surveyors will have a, uh, I have mine here beside me actually, will have a, a tapered tip, whether it's two degrees, uh, four degrees, one degree, or zero degree, we can decide on this taper of um, of blockout uh, arm. Here in the nay surveyor, we're going to use the analyzing rod at zero, if not point something very, very thin to block out the undercut gauge. I see mine's a little bit off centered here. I'm going to just fix it up a little bit. Looks like it might have. There we go. So I'm going to uh, continue now to block out the height of contour. Excuse me, block out the, uh, the guide planes. So what I'm gonna do is uh, freehand drop some wax on the guide plane. I also have my graphite markings to see where the height of contour goes up to on the distal uh, guide surface of this 1-3. So I'm going to add block out wax uh, liberally. And then I'm gonna, while the max, wax is still molten, I'll bring the surveying rod and clean up the block out. Basically clean up the wax, uh, re removing any excess wax, which is uh, over blocking out this guide plane parallel to the path of insertion. At the same time while I'm here, I'll ledge my rot wire clasp I also got to keep in mind the profile of the rot wire clasp as not to bring my wax ledge up to the red line, but leave some uh, 
width for the uh, rot wire. So if the rot wire is, you know, X thickness, I should leave, you know, that much space below the red line is where I want the midpoint of my rot wire to engage the abutment tooth. And now this ledge will be replicated in my refractory model and therefore, uh, you know, making it a lot easier for me to uh, fit the framework uh, post-casting. Now, we can also uh, choose to make our duplicate model prior to blocking out or after. If I'm going to use a hydrocolloid duplication method, I'll probably duplicate my model after to make sure and ensure that I have a suitable casting. If I have a silicone uh, duplication, then I can go ahead and do that prior or either way because I'll have a permanent silicone duplicate of my block out which if I need to for any reason uh, report quickly for a secondary refractory model if I have to go in that direction hopefully we never have to do that I'm going to ledge the buckle arm of the acres clasp I got the wax still slightly molten and I'm going to remove any excess of my guide surface here on the molar. There's not much on the molar. I'll just reheat it again here. Seems like it was a little bit too firm. Now keep in mind this ledge that I'm waxing for my reciprocal or and or retentive arms, I don't want to uh, have that ledge go beyond the point angle of the abutment tooth into the guide surface area. I don't want to have a ledge in my guide plane. I want that nice and smooth, all four of them parallel to the path of insertion, highly polished. So I can't have a ledge there creating a step. So I'm going to start my ledge beyond the point angle of this. Uh, with a lot of experience, you don't have to ledge. You'll just have your master model in front of you while you're waxing. And I think uh, the, an experienced dental technician can locate the wax profile in relation to the line drawn on the master model prior to duplication. So there we have the uh, one three and one six completed. I'm just going to ledge the reciprocal arm here. Now we're going to have this uh, um, height of contour, excuse me, the reciprocal arm above the height of contour. In future projects, we'll talk about the width and location of the reciprocal arm. But for now, if we can have a midpoint above the height of contour on the lingual side between the occlusal surface and the survey line. And then we can talk in the future projects about the more mechanics and uh, academic locations of this reciprocation of the retentive arms. So I'm going to continue the same as on 2 3. Remove any excess wax. And then I'll move to the labial side and carefully ledge for the rot wire clasp. I may go back and uh, widen the ledge a little bit later on the 2-3. This molar here, one seven, seemed to have more of a guide plane undercut than the other side due to the natural shape of the clinical crown. We can't alter the shape of the clinical crown post final impression, obviously. This has to be any alterations clinically have to be done prior to the final impression. I think a more successful removal of prosthodontics occur when there's good case planning. If the practitioner rushes straight into alginate impression and says, go ahead and make the framework, I think that's where we see a lot of the uh, issues arise. It needs to have good treatment planning, good patient consultation. So the patient has complete expectation of what the prosthetic can do and its limitations and what it can't do. 
even though successfully we may complete the partial denture technically successfully, uh, sometimes the cases fail um, due to the uh, consultation phase with the client. So we have to look after our end of the uh, bargain, so to speak, or our end of the treatment plan, and the practitioner will satisfy their end of the treatment plan. So I'm going to ledge here. Now, one thing I kind of cavalierly rushed into is that I did not, I just marked the retentive arms. I, mean, I should have marked the whole uh, outline of the cast partial. Uh, with blue, I will outline the reciprocal arm, uh, reciprocal areas. These are passive areas, obviously illustrated in blue. Red is active areas. And normally I would start by outlining the edentulous areas. Sharp pencil is good. This uh, external finishing line that I'm uh, scribing on the model is simulating the just beyond the lingual gingival margin of the prosthetic four and five. Try not to sag the external finishing line here or conversely way up in the center of the ridge. You need to have some uh, a sense of visualization of these lingual gingival margins. Again, no straight lines in the cast partial denture. I would tend to, you know, have some turned lines as there's more strength in a curved line. Plus, I think it looks aesthetically a little bit more pleasing. So my step one would be outline the edentulous areas. Step two would be identify the guide surfaces blocked out and scribed uh, in red pencil my retentive arms. Uh, then reciprocal arms, which would be on or above the height of contour uh, for my uh, lingual reciprocal arms of my acres clasps. And on the canines, these are going to be aproned. Now, naturally, the height of the apron has to be checked with the occlusion. Now, this occlusion is end-to-end -end in the anterior, so there's lots of room to cover the lingual single, lingual single and uh, with uh, apron coverage. As I bring this down, I gotta be, uh, when I'm designing my major connector, I should be cognizant of the mid-palatine raffae or the midline suture so that we have left and right side symmetrical. If I have problem with symmetry, then maybe I should make some uh, dots and then connect the dots afterwards. I think I have a couple here in the midline. Now, how wide is my palatal strap or horseshoe major connector? Obviously, I think it should not be any wider than the posterior occlusion being replaced on the widest side, which would be about here on the second quadrant. Again, the major connector should not uh, uh, try to avoid any anatomy here. So we're going to go around the largest rugae. We're going to go below the incisive papilla, around the largest rugae on the second quadrant, and then back up to the mesial of the canine for the apron. So here's somewhat symmetrical. And then now on the posterior uh, extension of the major connector, I mean, this is uh, some controversy, uh, or I should say different design techniques. I mean, in more of an American way is if we designed this major connect, uh, if, we if we divided the posterior abutment into three, then the major connector should sag back maybe about a third of the abutment tooth and then conversely turn back up to the midline. And then you can see a really deep cleft here in this vaulted uh, palette here. And we're gonna turn back to the midline and avoid this cleft here. Conversely, if I divided on the other side, divided by three, maybe sag back about a third of this abutment tooth, turn back here towards the center and then symmetrically match the arches of the other side. So here we have our major connector, not quite symmetrical yet. I'm gonna move this up a little bit here. And I think the uh, more anterior line is more symmetrical. And this stops us from making some type of, you know, GPS posterior uh, palatal bead line, meaning go from the midpoint straight to the guide plane in a straight line, you know, making it look like a, you know, Dorito cheese, sti uh, cheese stick, cheese chip oh, yeah, yeah. type of major connector. So we have to have some symmetry, some curvatures, no straight lines. And then once I'm satisfied 
with my block out and my major connector design, I can take my number seven spatula or any other type of instrument that I'm comfortable with uh, carving. I'm going to use the number seven, I think, but I'll see if I have something here. I have my Hollenbach carver. You can use whatever you feel comfortable with. And then I'm going to carefully scribe. Now, if your model is very dry, this is going to be difficult. Please try to refrain from using any type of handpiece to carve the model. Why am I putting on a bead line? Well, I guess the bead line compensates for any shrinkage of the, the alloy under casting. Compensates for any uh, deviation if I'm using hydrocolloid technique. But these days, investments and are so fine that if you had uh, silicone duplication under bar, under pressure, you wouldn't probably need a, a bead line at all. Uh, although uh, being, let's say, beginners or novices in the cast partials, we'll use the bead line, and this will aid in our uh, trimming. So at least we have a, a definite end point of our, of our trimming. It will kind of guide us after casting. Now, naturally, not as uh, uh, deep in the uh, mid-palatine suture as this is kind of a, a bony eminence, a little bit deeper in the soft tissue that can uh, have some depth of submucosa. So last but not least is our block out for our mesh uh, acrylic denture base on the uh, uh, first quadrant and second quadrant. Now this relief comes in different thicknesses. We're going to use a 0.7 millimeters thickness. And I would get, uh, get my Bard Parker knife or surgical blade knife. And uh, carefully remove a little bit larger than the area of wax needed. Once I have the block out in place, make sure I have it the right width between guide planes, and then take a sharp instrument of your surgical knife and carve over your outline. This sharp ledge is creating the internal finishing line. Now, if you choose to use a horizontal shoe extension, was not prescribed, I could use a small square or have a metal um, metal denture base adjacent to the abutment teeth here, like I've shown on one seven and one three, excuse me, one six and one three. And you can see that came off. The model was slightly cold here. Or I should say the wax. So you can see this width of maybe two millimeters here uh, adjacent to the abutment teeth. This is a horizontal shoe extension. I think the more traditional horizontal shoe extension, if I could illustrate it here, would be like a small square, two to three millimeter square. And that would be, I'll just take some off here. And that would be adjacent to the abutment tooth like this. If you could visualize a tissue stop. But I think a more prudent uh, horizontal shoe extension would be this long space here, sharp, exposing the tissue on both sides. It's not imperative that we do so, but we'll take it as an educational moment to uh, talk about horizontal shoe extensions, which is going to preserve the width of the guide plane. And it also preserves the length and serves as a definite finishing point of acrylic on the intaglio surface of the cast partial. Conversely, when we have no horizontal shoe extension, the acrylic kind of joins the casting in a haphazard fashion, kind of rounding out or blunting the, the junction point between the carriage and the guide plane of acrylic. So um, you can do either side's Either way, I just took it as a moment to talk about horizontal shoe extensions. 
I'm going to take some base plate wax here and seal down the block out. And once I've sealed down the block out, I can proceed to duplicate my master model blocked out for creation of a refractory model. Now, if using hydrocolloid, definitely soak the model as this will, you know, not adhere to the hydrocolloid nor create any kind of voids or bubbles in the hydrocolloid. If doing silicone, uh, not necessary to soak the model at all. But what you could do uh, for silicone to ease in the release of the model from the silicone is possibly block out this whole anterior area under my spatula as to make ease of removal of the uh, master model. So there we have uh, project one for DEN 2004, the Kennedy Class 3 Modification 1. Um, and then our next video will show the wax up of this preparation model. Thank you.